We made it. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> so, I'm I'm here, and so are you at the same time. Um, welcome to being on Brave New Podcast, and um, and especially thank you for coming and playing with me with uh, Orwell. Uh, for those of you who don't know Lisa, she is uh, knitting rows, uh, a fabulous dyer, a mom of two, three boys, four. Oh, see. Three boys, one three boys, one girl. And one of I think the really important things about having you here to be um, a voice with some authority is as a, a mother of um, people who have been in service, which Orwell's language plays directly into. And I was very, very happy to know that I was going to be able to talk to you about this stuff because I think um, it's especially important for people to recognize how language gets used around military issues, particularly. Right. <laughs> you almost got them all. You almost had a quadfecta. Wow. Wow, that is really cool. Okay, yeah, you're definitely good. <gasps> I'm glad we brought you. So I was going to do the um, uh, first couple of pages of the PowerPoint because I wanted people to see um, a couple of things about Orwell just in general. Uh, the most important one is dispelling the, the myth that I think a, a lot of people suffer under that, uh, that or Orwell is uh, boring or snooty or um, all about... Uh, being pretentious and using big words and all that kind of stuff. And I, he's kind of the opposite of all of that. And I think this quote says it all, that he's, he is a man of the people and he really, really did not want to have anything to do with the kind of intelligentsia, that class in England at the time. And in fact, he, um, he got a scholarship. Let's see, he went from... India, where he'd grown up with his family, he got a scholarship to go to Eton. So he went to Eton. And then he got a scholarship to go to Cambridge, I think. And he said, hell no. And went back and he worked as a, um, he was in the British army. I'm trying to remember what part of India he was in, but he was, he was in India. And that's where he wound up writing the story, the short story, Shooting an Elephant, which is probably a really important thing to read too. Uh, Cause it's very different from 1984 or Animal Farm. But um, but he's so not who I thought he was when I was in school because I read Animal Farm first and then I read 1984 and you know you walk away going, wow that guy's really depressing. Yeah, it sticks with you. <laughs> That's interesting. Do you think that it's his his um, the way he builds that world the way that he he uses language that that does it or do you think it's just plot and character where does the where does the dividing line come down do you think right because you gotta you gotta get double think and double speak and and uh double plus good and ungood and all of that I also thought his his part, which we will uh, we will get to, if not today, another day, um, the part in the essay where he talks about um, democracy as a as a word, as an abstract thought, um, having been uh, hijacked not in a necessarily a negative way, but in a positive way because the abstraction of democracy is so universally, it's a a good a capital a capital G good kind of the platonic ideal of, wow, everything is working great because it's a democracy. And, um, and that as a consequence, that put political leaders in other countries in that really horrifying role of saying that their dictatorship was actually a democracy. Oh, look at how happy our people are in our democracy. They vote. 100% of them vote. And he even says it's impossible to define, which I thought was interesting, which is so true of so many of the 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 words that he brought up and that was the 
the other thing about his his whole thesis of laying this out that I thought was interesting, I was reading comments online. Um, Genius.com has a, a, it's a fantastic website that started as a repository of rap lyrics. So people could like comment on all the genius of their rap artists, which actually sounds like I'm being facetious, but I'm not. There were really interesting things that were going on. Um, but then they realized, oh, well, we can do public domain literature. So they started bringing all that stuff over. And so there is a copy of Orwell's Politics in the English Language on Genus.com. And one of the comments at the very, very beginning said, you're going to think from this per first paragraph that he's about to tell you how important it is for you to write like a college professor and be all snooty and highfalutin in your language and stuff. Trust me when I say <laughs> this man does not want you to do that. He wants you to talk like a normal person so that people can understand you. And he really wants you to be understood. And when you can't understand other people, that is a warning sign that so something something needs to get fixed. And that and they're and they're trying to do something probably. And that's that's probably not a not a good something in general. One of the one of the things that I'd been playing with as far as trying to to set out kind of the the big the big picture of what Orwell was was up to when he wrote this essay and he wrote this before he wrote 1984 so this precedes his double speak and his double think which I thought was kind of cool by by a couple of years he was he was already sick but he wasn't dying quite yet um, and I realized in order to say it really succinctly I was going to have to break a bunch of his rules so I also thought that would be kind of fun so when I say the word language I'm talking about all, all, of, all of our communicative language, speaking, thinking, writing, listening, all of that. So the thing that I, I came up with was we language the way we think and we can only think the way we language, <laughs> which, which is ridiculous, but it is also true. If our language is limited, and he uses the word foolish, which I kind of liked, um, but if our language is limited, then we are necessarily going to be limited in the kinds of things that we can think about, which I think is a, a particularly scary, a particularly scary thing, because that seems to be a, a real, a real problem uh, in general, and one that isn't getting any better. Right. And I'd, I think it's the same kind of thing that we've, um, we've talked about before. Uh, over on Craftlet, I know with um, little kids, when when little like the terrible twos, people talk about the terrible twos. We had the terrible threes and fours, but I think in in all of those cases, it's generally when the kids are having a a really hard time getting the language that they needed to be able to say the thing they wanted to say, and and I know with with my boys when they were having a really hard time interpersonally with people, I would usually go to them and say, do you need words? And more often than not, it was, uh-huh. And then, you know, then you're just trying to guess. Well, it might be this. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not unique to children, I don't think. And the, the idea that you can expand your... Uh, language limitations, I think, is also really, really important because it's, it's as simple as watching a nature documentary or watching um, your kids at a concert where they have to sing a really complicated song, and and you have to wind up asking them questions about it. You know that that all of a sudden your language is expanding because of an experience you've had, not necessarily because you had to sit down with a book. And I think Orwell would have been very pro experience as well. He seems to have been. It goes along with what you were saying at the beginning about knitting too. Is the if you're if you spend if you spend some of your time trying new things, testing new things, doing new things, your brain your brain expands to hold that new information as well. And and with that comes some amount of of language and oh it just I hadn't thought about this I had a horrible time with math I didn't understand upper level math which I was in and almost failing 
uh, until I started playing Bach. Yeah, I didn't play Bach for a long time. I played lots of other stuff. I, I even pl started to play Chopin before I really played Bach, uh, an actual real difficult piece. And I remember having one of those moments, those weird kind of out-of-body moments, sitting at the piano going, oh, oh, it's all just math. Memorizing Bach was really easy because it was just memorizing patterns. It was the numbers. And it translated. Yeah. And I think that he, um, that Orwell does a nice job of... Um, being fun, which I know sounds so weird when you talk about Orwell. It's like, oh, I'm sure he's just a riot at parties. Um, but he but he is. He has fun with uh, the different the different ways that he seems to respond to words. Like when he's making fun of the other writers, which he does as part of his 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 larger essay. One of the one of the things that I liked about the um, the Genius.com was uh, one of the people put up a, a hen house, which I thought was a lot of fun. <clears throat> and so one of the, the steps that I was, I was trying to kind of distill out the steps. And so one of them was that style and meaning are interactive. They, they relate to each other far more directly than I was ever taught in school. And I don't know about, about the way that you were taught in school, but style didn't get talked about in Arizona for a really long time. <laughs> Meaning sort of, kind of, but mostly it was, you know, do you have sentences? Do you have periods? Are they run on, run on fragments or fragmentary run ons or? Yeah, um, his, his idea, and I've got all my, all my papers that I wrote all over. Um, he's the one who brought up the, the hen house. And he said that the, the way that we make our sentences now and again, he's not blaming anyone in particular. It's not like he's blaming schools. He's not blaming teachers. He's not blaming society. And he's not even blaming politicians necessarily. It's just the language has decayed. And along with it, one of the things that's decayed is our ability to, to make meaning out of what we're saying. And um, and so I liked his his little image that if you... If you write the way that everybody's writing around you, it's like a prefab hen house. It's, yeah, it functions mostly. It doesn't do a better job. It doesn't do a more specific job. It's just kind of a blob of hen house, um, which I thought was, was funny because uh, I imagine hen houses were a little more common back, <laughs> back when, he, when he was doing this post-war. People, if people were lucky enough to have chickens, especially right after the war in '46. When when I was in school, imagery was always something that had been tied... Imagery, metaphor, and simile. They were always things that had been tied to fiction writing. So, metaphors. Um, metaphors, literature, all of that stuff. Similes, they, it was so restricted to flowery language and language that was going to be used for fiction writing, and that was pretty much it. And recognizing things like fiction writing and... Uh, recognizing simile and stuff in fiction writing. So when it suddenly became um, clearer that Orwell's focus was on metaphor, I got really interested because one of the things, I'm going to put the image up, one of the things that he says is get rid of dying metaphors. And he was, he's pretty specific about his dying metaphors. Um, and I was trying to think of ones that we hear often and if you can see the screen, you'll notice that it has a picture of a Christmas pudding. And one of the dying metaf dead metaphors that I hear all the time is not only a dead metaphor in the United States, but it's a incorrect and dead metaphor or dead because it's incorrect. We always say things like the proof is in the pudding. In fact, I was I was watching Morning Joe today and on Morning Joe, they had um a Jesuit priest on who was awesome, who then said the proof is in the pudding. And I went, Oh, I've already made the slide. I win because the proof is not in the pudding. How could the proof be in the pudding? How would you know that the proof is in the pudding unless you eat the pudding? And the original line was the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. 
which is distinctly different and not what anybody says because it takes longer and it's weird. And we don't, in the United States anyway, we don't make these kinds of puddings very, very frequently. And that puts us at a disadvantage as far as Orwell goes because we are now straying into territory where we are not only not communicating, but we are actively being unclear. And that doesn't do anything good for us if we want to be communicative with other people. Some other dying metaphors that they listed, and these were listed over on Genius.com. Bite the dust. Dead as a doornail, which, check this out, was first written down. The first extant writing with it was like in 1360. That sucker is an old, old dying metaphor. Uh, having butterflies in your stomach, being a sitting duck, thinking outside the box, going out on a limb, turning over a new leaf. These are things that we all say, but do, do any of us really know why? I mean, we know what they mean in general, but they're, they're not, not particularly, particularly specific. specific. And they don't really evoke a visual image in our minds. So with the dying metaphors, Orwell, Orwell goes on, and, uh, and I loved this image that they had on the, on the Genius.com site too, the Got Empty, Empty Clichés, because that's one of the other things that he rails about. Anything that's cliched, anything that is a, a metaphor that doesn't actually evoke an image in your mind, it's a waste of your time. And if you're a listener, it's an indication that the person who is speaking or writing either doesn't know what they're talking about or doesn't care. Oh, now you're there. Yay. Oh, way more better. Oh, good, because now you're right in time for the fun part. So um, I had this all set up to do transitions, but I can't get my screen to do that for us now. So um, when we were doing uh, metaphors and uh, similes when I was teaching high school, my husband, Andrew, taught me a way to teach metaphors and similes that actually made me, as the teacher, go, oh, seriously? How did I not know this before? And it, because it just hadn't occurred to me that way. And I think it gets right to the heart of why Orwell makes such a big deal right off the bat in this essay about metaphor and simile. So the first thing is you have to, you have to picture a pig. And, and we have a our ideas of what pigs are. And so when I would, I drew a board, uh, you know, a pig on the board in chalk, which was kind of hysterical because it didn't look as good as the pig that I've got here. And then I would say to the kids, all right, so now you've, you've got the image of pig, even if it's a pathetic one on the chalkboard, what words come to mind when you think of pig? And inevitably we would get things like fat, pork, pink, smelly, bacon, police, because I told them everything was fair game. Curly tails, breakfast, mud, messy, sty, floppy ears. Some years we filled the board with words that were attached to the idea of pig somehow. And then I would say, okay, so come up with a simile. For any, just pick one of these words, but you have to make a simile using pig and one of these words. So do any similes pop into your head with any of the pig words. They don't have to be the ones that are on the screen. It can just be things you think of. Well, sometimes we had kids get complicated and they said, your, your bedroom looks like a pigsty. And we'd say, well, that, you know, that absolutely functions because you've got the pig idea, you've got the sty idea, and it's a simile because you're using like or as. So that was fine. Or you're as fat as a pig or... Absolutely. No. No. Well, not, and that's one of the reasons why we used it in class, because then the kids were... But I figured they'd remember if it was something that they probably shouldn't be... Like, especially when they called out cop and all the other kids go, I know. Well, it's not a nice thing to say. And now we all know why. Okay, so let's move on. They're not going to be nice things, which is also a really important thing to start to notice. It's like, well, is that, is that a fair... Is that a realistic simile? Are they playing with an idea? You know, why Why would you say your, your cheeks are as pink as a piggy's butt? You know, is that a backhanded compliment? You know, what's really going on here? There's all sorts of things that you can start paying attention to. But then we got onto metaphors and it was, okay, now come up with a metaphor that either uses one of these words or uses something about a pig. And the, the kids would sit there for a really long time and eventually somebody would say, you pig. 
we'd say, okay, well, what did you mean? And they went, well, I meant that you smell really bad. And another kid would say, but that's not what I thought you meant. I thought what you meant was that I was really messy. And another kid, th- you know, I thought you were talking about the way I, my bedroom looks. You know, that's the kind of thing my mom says to me. Or how fat I am. Exactly. And so all of a sudden, the metaphor you choose, the, the lack of or the specificity of that metaphor means everything. And so if you're creating metaphors for that where people can't see you, you have to be very specific one way. If they can see you, you can be very specific another way. If you're writing, you have to be really crazy specific because they can neither see or hear you in real life. They can't hear your tone. Right. Right. Even even something as simple as when I was in Dallas visiting and I was schooled in the Oh, bless his heart. <laughs> it's, it is not the same phrase that if you come from the North, you might think it is. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then what was yeah. Yeah. envisioned? So if you even, even now, if you tried to go and do 1984... It could not be true to the words themselves, the the description of the speak right or the description of even the pneumatic tubes are outdated. Right. That's it's it's silly. Now right. it would be a fax machine or you know, most of it would be done on a computer anyway. Right. Oh, right. Oh, which man. which how much easier would it have been to make the corrections if everything was kept electronic? Right. <laughs> So corrections. I can't believe I said corrections. <laughs> I know. I was trying to explain footnotes, the pain, the pain of footnotes <gasps> to my kids back when, uh, back when if you, if you did it wrong, <laughs> and oh, you, had gosh. To, you had to take the whole sheet out of the page and you had to measure and, you know, throwing off one line threw off your entire paper. Oh yeah. And if you misspelled something or left out a sentence... God forbid. God help you. You know, <laughs> I know my, and my mom was, she was, she was a, a, a really good typist and she would type all my stuff for me because I didn't know how to type yet. You know, it's not like now where even my grandkids, my, my 10 year old grandson can type on a computer as fast as I can. Wow. You know, it's, Ten. I know, I know. Um, and so she would retype things for me. But if I left out a sentence, right. it was like, oh, please, mom. She'd be like, you look through the whole rest of this thing before I do anything. <laughs> <laughs> because that was retyping usually five pages. Yeah. Unless you could make it work by pushing a line here or, you know, keeping a line. And then you could maybe save three of those pages, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it is that is something that actually hadn't occurred to me before. But when Orwell's talking about all of this. Um, care with writing and you know, really thinking about what it is that you're trying to say and then figure out the best way to say it, best way to communicate it. He was living in a world that didn't have ballpoint pens yet. Oh, yeah. So oh. writing was a slower process. Much slower. All the way around. Oh, and about think that. about this. This is something that hasn't even come up yet. It When... When Winston is making a correction to a, a newspaper article, say, mm-hmm. okay, and he has to put in a new news, new newspaper article, mm-hmm. it has to fit the old newspaper article completely. <gasps> You're right. The space it adds, that it fills. He, he And he alludes to that. He does allude to that because he talks about it. You'd have to do all this back checking and make sure that you cross-referenced everything and it would take too much space. Right. It didn't occur to me. That's true. He's going to have like column inches. You know how much? Yeah. He might only have three inches. And so he's got to fill that three inches the way and the way it ends because, you know, sometimes it's only part of the next column or whatever. Right. And you either have to end it properly or you have to put a picture in there oh, or something, you know, oh. it's, it's not, it's, it's the geography, not just 
right. the words themselves. Just the words themselves. That's really interesting. Yeah, those aren't things we have to think about much. No, we don't have all. to think. Well, and now it's it's not. You know, if you need something to fit in the same amount of space, you can reparse the rest of the the rest of the page. Right. No, absolutely. You know, it's it's not a big deal. Hmm. Easily. Hmm. I like that. I like the fact of that. That's really cool. It's there. There are every once in a while. In 1984, especially less so animal form because it's very much an allegory and it feels like a fable that it is. Um, yeah. But definitely in 1984, there are moments that are so painfully modern, and then there are these other moments that don't. It, they don't break the connection, but they they add a different flavor to the connection so there's a weird because it's not nostalgia that you're getting but it's like you were saying there's something about the book that's very affecting and it's communicated through the language it is it is oh, it's such an interesting thing well the the thing that i thought was also interesting about um politics in the english language aside from the fact that it isn't boring because i mean we all as english teachers have done a huge disservice to the world by forcing essays on unsuspecting children and doing oh. it in such a way that they then walk away going, wow, those were really boring. And they shouldn't be. You know, the, some of the most important communications that have been made over the course of history have come across as essays. And they're not five paragraphs long. And they don't all start with a single introductory paragraph and, you know, all of that. And in fact, I was looking at Orwell's structure he actually has a spiral structure. He starts to loop back and repeat stuff, but with new twists on it. And then his his conclusion isn't so much a conclusion as it is um, uh, several paragraphs on recommendations for a way out. But it's not like he's saying what he said in the beginning. You know, it's not like restate your introduction and no, yeah, because no, no, you're sense. absolutely right. He he does revisit the same ideas from mm -hmm. a different aspect, a different look or a different perspective. He, I mean, yes, it, it, you're absolutely right. And he, he really doesn't ever draw conclusions. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. He wants you to do that. Yeah. He wants you to get you off your butt and start doing, <laughs> doing the good work. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and he does, he does give some help. He does have rules to live by. And I, I started trying to distill them down for the, the PowerPoint slides. And the the first one that we, we already looked at was the dying metaphors. And that was pretty easy because it was straightforward. And then I got to rule number two and I said, well, that's really concision. And then I went on to rule three and went on to rule four and went, oh, darn it. They're all, they're all really aspects of concision. And he has them written out way late in the essay. It's like, I don't know what, the 10th page? And this is like book pages. This isn't long eight and a half by 11 pages. This is, it's not that kind of long thing at all. It probably takes 20 minutes to read, maybe. And probably more like 40 minutes if you read with a pencil in your hand or a pen in your hand. Right, right. Um, which I found it impossible not to because I kept going, oh my God, oh my God. Um, but he has, he has his stuff listed out. And when he got to rules two, three, and four, they all seem to work on the same kind of model. Um, don't use long words if you can use short ones. And a lot of that will look wrong shortly because there's a, a slide that I have coming up. I don't know if you noticed it where uh, somebody went through and did the Flesh Kincaid rating, which is a grade level reading level um, of political candidates. And I saw, yeah, I saw yeah. that. So when you look at this, him recommending don't use long words if you can use a short word that communicates just as well, it might be easy for people to make assumptions that they shouldn't make because they'll be wrong. <laughs> and his, I think his, his point was if you hear somebody trying, trying to show off with a lot of fancy words, there's a good chance that they're just talking humbug. And for him, humbug is BS. It's, it's his right. nice 1946 way of saying they're full of it. Yeah, well, it. I just had personal experience with this not too long ago, <laughs> because because I went and and this is I'm not dissing anybody, but it was it was a lawyer. I went to a lawyer, mm -hmm. and I asked him a question, <laughs> and he 
very eloquently and very beautifully avoided every question that I asked him Mm -hmm. until the very end. And because I kept asking the same question many different ways Mm -hmm. and in Mm -hmm. such so many different styles that he finally could not avoid because you want to double speak me, go ahead. But guess what? (laughs) Yeah. I'll do it too. And I finally did get an answer out of him and he was, he really didn't want to give the answer. He really didn't want to say it was, it was so funny. It was almost painful to watch because you could, I could see him go (sighs) boom. And then he answered, but all of his body language was like, okay, okay. I've done all I can. I really can't tap dance anymore. Fine. Right. But he was very eloquent. He was very, I mean, he was great at at what he did. And it made me want to hire him. It actually made me hire him because, you know. Because he could do it. Yeah, because he could do it. And he did it so well. Yeah. And you want somebody who can baffle the other people with BS. Right. I mean, assuming that they need to be baffled. Well, you you want somebody who can tap dance. You really do. You do. You do. And I think that that's, um, that's a really important distinction to make is that the, the, somebody's ability to obfuscate the obvious or baffle everybody with their BS in a, a convincing way in pursuit of justice. Do the ends justify the means? I think several, several times I can think of in my life, I would have to say, Yeah. Should it be that way? Probably not. But but that's not the world we live in, you know? It's, right. Andrew keeps saying, we don't live in the land of should. <laughs> and and I hate it when people should on me anyway, so. <laughs> Who wants to be should on? Nobody I wants know. to be should on. It's so true. No, I I just had that conversation with Thing, too. It's like, listen, you. I know you're trying to help your friends, but you really need to stop saying, well, you should, because then yeah. it's not going to work well for you in the long run. <laughs> Really not going to work out well. Lawyers, I think, have a, a particular uh, talent when it comes to some of the humbuggery that Orwell talks about. He also, one of his rules, rule, rule number three, is if you can cut a word out, do cut the word out. Um, which always makes me think of that that letter from uh, Pascal, the mathematician who who wrote to a friend, I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> which I always think is just awesome. It's such a great well, see, line. And I love or I love these rules of, of conciseness. I really do because that's the way I write. Mm. I do write. I, I mean, I, I always have. And in the corporate world, which I'm no longer in the corporate world, but in the corporate world, it's important to write that way. Yes. You're supposed to, you're, you're supposed to, do all, you're supposed to do all these pretties you know for me if i'm answering an email it's yep nope okay got it let's yep. go who wants to you waste know time? right and i've actually had to have i've had, actually had i had to learn in the corporate world to write longer you know yes i understand your your opinion here and i really value that and thank you so much for for your input and here is what's going to happen and you know yeah. blah, blah, this is the way we're going to move forward i mean i had and i've had to learn that with my own business too, yeah. Because customer customer service, the same thing. Yeah. You know, somebody asks you a question: Is it, I'm doing this, and is this the correct way to do it? Well, you want to just write back, "Yep." <laughs> Next. <laughs> yeah, Moving and on. and you can't. You have to go. Yes, you're doing it the right way. It's you know, I I really appreciate you taking the time to contact me, and anytime I can help you in the future, blah blah blah. blah. You know, all these words. Yep. All these words. Have you discovered text expander? No, I have a Brad. (laughs) Oh, no, I need to uh, remind me to introduce you to Text Expander. Okay. Yeah, it'll rock your world. I'll usually make Brad read something. If I can't expand enough, I'll make him read it. I'll go, okay, go ahead and fix this. You know, add the words. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And he does. He's great at it. That's fantastic. Yeah, he's really, I mean, he took, I had a two sentence, three sentence paragraph that he took and made three paragraphs out of once. And I was like, awesome. He's the husband of humbuggery. I get it. Yes. I get it. He's good. Well done. <laughs> well done, sir. Well, and it's funny that you mentioned that in 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 corporate talk because the the other one 
uh, rule four for Orwell is avoid passive voice. And that always makes me kind of, because while I was constantly fighting my students to get them to use more specific verbs, fewer adverbs, quickly, slowly, happily, jauntily, fewer adverbs, better verbs, um, mm-hmm. and and therefore often more active verbs. I found when I got into the corporate world that if I continued using active verbs in my emails and sometimes mail writing, I would just piss everybody off. Instead, yes. it has to be taken back a step and couched in this Again, because you can't see somebody's face, you can't hear their tone of voice, you have to kind of make sure that it's not uh, affronting whatever it is that yes. you're trying to communicate. And so I, I particularly, because of all this, I particularly like his sixth rule, which we'll get to in a minute. But um, but I, I understand the reason that they say active voice. Mm-hmm with the caveat and the same thing with the, the brevity. I think you can, I think the thing I I have a feeling with Brad and we should probably someday secretly take a look at something that he did that for, for you is that he's, (laughs) we should, he's probably not just adding garbage. Oh no. He's adding adding politeness. He's adding clarity and, and uh, yes, definite tone. Yeah. He's definitely adding, um, it, trust me, if it, if it wasn't, if it added nothing, I wouldn't take it. Well, yeah. I really would because I'm not going to do that. That's not going to happen. No, but he would add time. either either the right the right tone to it or the right PC value to it, you know, or right. c- clarity. You know, I mean, there was definite, there, there were definite true additions that were being made that I didn't think about. And I have to remember mm. myself whenever I'm writing something, not to use it or that or... Oh, yeah. You because need to have the antecedent connected to the whatever it is that you're talking about or be more specific. Well, even even that, even even if you are writing something and you've already got the, the noun defined, when you re-reference it in a, in a later sentence, you have to make sure you restate. Mm-hmm. Because... It could refer to three other nouns in the previous three statements, mm-hmm. literally, and and often does. Yes, so you have to you have to make sure for clarity's sake you have to restate your words. Yeah, your actual word, your actual <laughs> the actual thing you were trying to communicate. Right. How wacky! How wacky! <laughs> well, and that and actually the corporate talk and and all of that sneaks right in onto um, the next slide that I have is I don't know if you've ever seen the retro encabulator before so the retro encabulator was a completely goofy thing that someone did as a joke uh, ages ago here at Rockwell Automation's world headquarters research has been proceeding to develop a line of automation products that establishes new standards for quality technological leadership and operating excellence with customer success as our primary focus work has been proceeding on the crudely conceived idea of an instrument that would not only provide inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal gram meters such an instrument comprised of Dodge gears and bearings, Reliant electric motors, Allen Bradley controls, and, as you, and all monitored as you watch by Rockwell thing, Software uh, is... It becomes more and more clear that there is just no there there at all. <laughs> it is just hysterical. And it, it, he really gets into the, some very, very specific language that means nothing. It is, it is purely strung together... <laughs> It really is. Yes, there's, it really there's, is. I mean, there's a lag between me right. seeing it and and you're you're talking about it. I mean, what? But oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. No, it is. It is just a genius piece of work on on their part, and and it's because it's so hard to explain why jargon is uh, dangerous. You know, just in general, why why it's dangerous, and and it goes along with the baffle them with BS thing. But it's also a complete and utter lack of clarity. 
because you can sound like you're saying something without actually saying something. And that gets really, really close to the political language that you start to see in 1984. Oh, my gosh. Yes, that's so true. Because I remember, okay, this goes way back. This goes back when I was in high school. Okay. And it and it was after I had read 1984, I'm sure. But a movie came out called Dune. Oh yeah. Okay. I remember Dune. Right. And it was this big thing, okay? And everybody went to go see it and all this stuff, you know. And I got to talking to a bunch of my friends at at lunch one day and I started expanding on the the metaphors and the illusions and all of the symbolism in mm-hmm. Dune. Mhm. And I was making it all up off the top of my head. <laughs> right that second none of it none of it came from any thought whatsoever and i was literally not saying anything and were they all impressed with you and how everybody was so impressed everybody was so impressed and they're like oh my gosh oh wow i never would have got that oh wow i'm gonna go back and watch it again you know and it was just that and and i just wanted to see how long i could talk about something that was completely ridiculous and not say anything at all right right because it's amazing how long you can do that for. And, and part of it is people don't want to admit that they don't understand and that's what you're a really saying. dangerous thing, yes. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. And when, when, when I was reading this section, I, you know, I was writing little notes to myself in the margins. But I got to the meaningless words section, and I all of a sudden, out of nowhere remembered an old Dennis Miller routine. It may have actually been off of his very first album where he was talking about pretentious wine drinkers and how, yeah. um, how they were just so full of it. And they'd you know, take a sip and say, hmm, busy, but never precocious. And you just go, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, that doesn't mean anything. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, I get that you can taste chocolate in some red wine. Maybe you can taste some cinnamon, but... Yeah. You and know. you can tap, yeah, there, there are a few. And you can't taste <laughs> precociousness. Mm-mm. No. Mm-mm. Well, and, and one, of the, one of the things that'll, that'll stop that really quick is kids. <laughs> they will. Yes, it will. I mean, my so kids, true. my kids specifically, I know, because there were many, many times when I was talking to them and they would interrupt and they still do to this day. And they're in their thirties now, you know, they, they would interrupt me and they would say, what does that mean? Yeah. What is, yeah. what is this phrase? My boys. And I have to turn around and stop and, and, and explain what that is. And then they're like, okay. And then we, we can keep going. But even the grandkids do it. Oh, They'll really? say, yeah. And I'm, I'm glad. And, and I always I stop, explain and move forward because you don't want somebody who's, who's afraid to do that. Yeah. No, that's because that's when you get the people who don't question yeah. out in the world, which is where <laughs> it gets really dangerous. <laughs> yes, that is true. That is so true. Yeah, and the the um, the one that I've heard a lot in the last nine years is unprecedented. I don't know that we've gone a day where I haven't heard that a day I watched the news or listened to the news where I haven't heard someone say the word unprecedented I'm like you know if you read history or ever paid attention to anything any of you said a year ago you would not be able to say that with a straight face because there's absolutely precedent for everything oh yeah I I mean, I can't actually think of anything, uh, anything in our lifetime. I'm, I'm really actually thinking hard now. I'm trying to think of something that was, oh, 9-11. 9-11 was unprecedented. And I say that with a very specific connector, which is um, when my students were saying, why didn't somebody predict this? Why weren't we protected? My, my fallback position was um, if you hadn't seen it in a movie, if a Hollywood screenwriter, people who are paid to invent stuff and not just paid to invent stuff, but paid to invent the worst stuff, you know, an asteroid is coming and we only have 48 hours to save the earth. If none of those people had come up with this particular scenario, then I think we can go with the word unprecedented. Right. But even so, had that occurred just six months later, it wouldn't have been unprecedented because there were movies that were were... on deck. Yes. Yeah. I do remember that. I yeah. do remember that. 
And that was, that was, that was eerie. Well, and, and that's one of those things. If, if you thought of it, somebody else probably has. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. The whole, there's nothing new under the sun thing. Right. Unventing, you know, type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And it's, um, the, uh, the way that that language gets manipulated out in the world to, to specifically, um, attack a particular heartstring or an emotion or a fear point you know there's some pressure point that those words are being aimed at and I don't know whether the people who are using them recognize that or not but um but one of the points that we get oh, to of course they do and the is that the it's us repeating the words that becomes the real problem you know if we just kind of went oh, full of it and all moved on eventually they for one thing they'd stop using it but or or if we turned around and did our did our own homework and took it found it from the other side right and actually looked at facts and compared. right yeah but that's a lot of work i've gotten to where i don't even comment on things it, like in facebook and stuff like that specifically no. i won't even comment on something if mm -hmm. i haven't researched it from several different places absolutely i even um i even started to draw a meme i'll i'll sketch out stuff all the time and i'll show it to the kids and they'll be like mom <laughs> No, I finally sketched out one and the 16 year old went, that one's pretty good, but you need to fix it this way. Ooh. And my idea was to take an image of, in this case, and for a very specific reason, an image of Trump looking unattractive and an image of Obama looking unattractive and an image of Trump looking attractive and an image of Obama looking attractive. And same text, same text, but reversed each time. So it was... Um, you know, screeching headline text uh -huh. over one of the images, proven Trump is Satan, proven Obama is Satan. You know. And it's if it sounds too good, it's not true. If it sounds too bad, it's not true. Yeah. So it doesn't matter which side you're on. You know, if, if I see something for my candidate that's like, oh, he's a genius. He's a work of art. This is so amazing. He's like, David, you know, Michelangelo's David. It's so spectacular. It's bull. Just as much as if I hear the candidate I don't like being vilified. It's well, and that's one of the, that's one of the politics problems mm -hmm. that we have currently yeah. is that you, it's all or nothing. There's right. no gray. Right. And people are not all or nothing. No. There is nobody who's perfect. No. I'm not perfect. I'm oh, also yes, not horrible. Are. You know, no, it's true. I know it's hard to believe. Um, <laughs> but it is. hey, you know, I, I can admit this about myself. There's one of the. <laughs> That's another reason why you're better than I am. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> no. <laughs> But that's just it. It's it's yeah. one of those things that nobody is perfect. Nobody is going to make all the right decisions. Yeah. An image has more to do because when you were talking about that, mm -hmm. I realized that the images themselves mm -hmm. have an influence. Mm -hmm. And that's that's something that has just happened in the last 50 years. Yeah. Kennedy. It started 50, with 60 Kennedy. years. Yeah. I mean, that's when it started because people on the radio listening to the Kennedy Nixon debate. People on the radio thought Nixon won. Absolutely. People on the who watched the television thought Kennedy won. Yeah, and it goes and it goes all the way back as far as like really really clear examples of that. Uh, Nixon Kennedy is the one that does the great comparison, and prior mm -hmm. to that, the one that uh, I was an adult, I could rent cars before I found out that FDR couldn't walk by himself as a president. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, they weren't even the image around then. Yeah. And it's interesting because that means that Orwell was around when that was just kind of starting. Yes. Um, but he was still part of the, you know, we will fight them on the land. We will fight them on the sea. He was still very tuned into the Churchillian radio and FDR radio address. Um, it would have been so fascinating if he had just lived till 64. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, definitely. Well, you know, I'm running into the same thing. I'm d I've been doing a... Uh, not research, but it kind of is just because I keep doing it um, on royalty. Well, yeah, you know, when yeah, you yeah. keep when you keep delving into the same st subject over and over, you are basically researching. Yeah. Whether you call it that or not. Yeah. And that's one of the things that the royalty the in England had an issue with 
was getting into the new age. Diana was the first one who got the image and got the whole, the queen tried to, when she initially did the documentary um, with her family, showing them as real people and, but it made them a little too real and they were no longer separate and above all, you know, because they got to be a little bit too regular and, and so they had to back away from that and, and trying to find that line into image right? because of the visibility due to television movies. The camera, just the camera alone being everywhere. Yeah. You know, and it's, sense. yeah, because when Prince Philip was uh, met Queen Elizabeth II, but when they met when she was 13 and he was, I think, 18 or 20, yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Um it was planned. It was planned just as much as Victoria and Albert back a hundred years prior. Wow. By family members. Yeah. Same, same scenario. Oh, but you one. didn't have, if we had had the media, would it, would she have seen that? Would he have seen that? Because both of them were kind of pawns. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I would definitely, I would definitely put them in that position. I think all, all of those, those marriages, the, um, I mean, I understand, especially going back several hundred years, you kind of go, okay, I get, I get the political thing. Yeah. But, but that, but uh, that's, well, no, I have to move that around. We don't live in that world, but I met people who still do live in that world. Where it's Which empire, world are empire, you talking about? Empire building of a different sort. It's it's uh, corporate empire building instead of um, physical geographical empire building. Okay. People who are really really wealthy. Yes. Those marriages are don't much get. Planned. No, they don't have a lot of choice. They don't have the freedom that we that we do in in at least that one area. Uh, not from not from the few that I've had a chance to meet. It doesn't sound like it. Oh, I'm sure not. That's just it. Different worlds, different things. Celebrity is a different world. Yeah. Oh um, my gosh. You don't have the privacy. You don't have, you know, getting to go to the grocery store, doing those regular things. Just schlepping around is not a possibility for yeah. some people. Yeah. Or going outside without makeup on. And we can't relate to that. We no. really can't. No. No. No, that was, I don't know if I ever talked about that on Craftlet. I was at a fundraiser. Uh, holy cow. I was a... It was between my freshman and sophomore year at UCLA, and I was at a fundraiser, and um, Robert Wagner and Linda Evans and Mark Harmon were the three co-hosts, and I spoke. And Robert Wagner and Linda Evans were lovely. I mean, they were just the nicest people. And this is in the middle of, like, heart-to-heart. You know, it was, he, was, he was on the upswing oh, yeah. of heart-to-heart thing, and so he's you know, dashing, and he's marvelous and she's you know tall and fabulous and gorgeous and all of that and and in real person she in real life she was even more beautiful than she was on tv but mark Harmon was the real interesting one because he had gone to ucla and so he and i got got to talking afterwards and up close he wasn't i mean he's still god he's mark Harmon, but you could tell the guy played football and he he got hit in the face Uh more than once you know he was a real person when I was talking to him and so it was really easy to feel like I was talking to a normal person (laughs) a normal person and then uh he walked me outside and the valet stand was it was one of those you know rent a rent a valet because it was done at somebody's house in um, Hancock Park and I had to wait for them to bring my car and he said oh I parked around the corner and at first I thought that was kind of weird until I saw what happened, like we had crossed the line out of the the gate. Um, it was a big hedger, like a 12 foot hedge around their backyard. And so you cross through the gate, the little arbor area. And all of a sudden it was a bank of two deep, 10, 15 people around of paparazzi. Yeah. This is right after Sean Penn decked the photographer. And I watched the way that they went after Mark Harmon and he was so kind and he let them get their pictures because that's how they made their money and, right. and he smiled when they asked him to smile and he did what he asked them to do and he stood there for about a minute and then he said guys I gotta get home to my wife and a couple of them were 
jerks about it. But most of them kind of went back to get the next picture coming out of the gate. Right. And, and he just kind of trotted on down uh, down the street and around the corner to his car. And I thought, well, that's why he did that. So he didn't have to stand here and wait for his car. And I really get why Sean Penn decked that guy. Oh, well, you know, if you watch some of the footage, yes. some of the footage that of, of royalty, cele- yes. celebrity, presidents, politi- politicians, whoever, okay, if you just listen to the clicking and watch yes, the flashes, the flashes. Oh, God. and I'm not talking on red carpet even no. when where you're going to expect it. No, I'm coming talking out of your apartment. Right, coming out of your apartment or standing on a balcony or going here, going whatever. It's appalling. Yep. And yep. you have to think how invasive yeah. that is. Yeah. And that's one of those places where the language, I think, has really, really messed people up. Because the, I remember this was the kind of the transition time between the, the way that stars had been treated when Marilyn was around. And she was the first to have really received this kind of treatment. But even she could go walk her dog around her block without makeup on. Right. She was allowed that much and she got hounded everywhere, but she, that was like off limits. And if people did get pictures of her, they didn't get them published partially because the studios shut them down. But, but we were in this weird transitional world where everybody was fair game and people started saying things like, um, well, you, you knew what you were getting into when you got the job. Like, no, no, no. In fact, kind of the opposite because most actors most actors don't ever hit that point number one and so number two you go into the job thinking that you're probably not going to hit that point really and Mm -hmm. and number three you can't know what I mean I thought I was and I had no idea what that was going to be like until I was in the middle of it not because of me but with someone else right and And you weren't even the focus oh no and it was and it still was probably yeah upsetting yeah very i can't even imagine i I mean yeah it's an assault yes and 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 then and then we now because of social media we have the the converse side which is the um if you're in that kind of media frenzy and all of a sudden the cameras go away now your your livelihood is threatened Mm-hmm. And so do you do Britney Spears where you start calling your publicist and saying, OK, I'm going out to dinner tonight at Spago just so you can have a chance of getting some cameras back so that you can keep working. And and what does it do to your ego? Oh, God. It's, I mean, it's, truly, because your worth is suddenly gone. Yes. Yes. And all dependent on the most ridiculous and useless parts of you. Yes. And it's, and ev- all of that goes back to valuing the language. You know, what is, what does our language show that we value? What is the, um, what are the discussions that are had on, on television news or on chat shows or on, um, in magazines and, and articles and things? What do we, what do we demonstrate to be our, our, our locus of, you know, the, these are the things that matter to us. And it's really awful. Yeah. Where is the import? Is it in the look? Is it in the image? Is it in the words? Is it in the ideas? Because your president, your, 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 whoever you're is running for political office, whoever, they have to be the entire package nowadays. Yeah. They have to be. Yeah. And that's something that England doesn't do. Not many, nobody is. No. Okay, nobody is the entire package. No, they're all going to fall short somewhere. But Andrew was pointing out the other day, I said, I can't remember what I said. I'm sure I said something stupid and disparaging of somebody since nobody else could hear me except him. So I can do that in front of him. Right. But he, um, he said, yeah, but that's the whole point in England is Jefferson kind of screwed us up by not leaving us someone who was a, a prime minister of manners. Because what happens then is your your president has to do all the stuff that a monarch would do in a in a um, constitutional what monarchy. They, yes, there you go. So, in a constitutional monarchy, you have your queen to do the ribbon cutting, and all of the heads of state come to visit, and so you're the one who throws the dinner, and you get to show off and do all that stuff, so that the people who are governing can sit down and actually, you know, do stuff. 
actually do the governing. Exactly. <laughs> I know it's wacky. But that means that that takes a lot of, as, as famous as Tony Blair got for being just Tony Blair, I can name two other prime ministers offhand in the last 50 years. No, three. I've got three. <laughs> Thatcher, John right. Major, because Major, old Major in Animal Farm, and uh, David Cameron. I, I see. Have, you, and I know there are more. Yeah, I know there are more. I don't know them. I don't know them. But but it's those those ones, and especially Tony Blair. Tony Blair gets famous because, like Clinton, he's young. He's the first baby boomer. You know, there's all these other things that had nothing to do with his governing. I think it's changing. I hope it's changing. Because of that. Because of that. No, 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 no. I, I think it's changing because of that. Putin, the same thing. Mm. It's it's the same. The image is becoming more important than the values. Yeah. Oh, it really I see is. what you're saying. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, yeah. I totally agree. I think it's changing. And I, th- fact, I think, I don't think Margaret Thatcher would, could, no. would be chosen now. I just don't. No. I, I am firmly in agreement with you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's like Kennedy on crack. Yeah. No. And that, and that actually, that actually starts to draw us towards the sixth rule that Orwell came up with was, uh, and perhaps my favorite one is break all of these rules to avoid bar- barbarity. <laughs> if you if you have to break a rule, <laughs> go ahead and do it. If it's going to avoid you saying something that's just horribly inaccurate or wrongheaded or barbarous. Um, but then I, I started to pull together this slide about why all of this stuff, why Orwell's essay, which of course goes into all of this stuff way more in depth than, than what we've been talking about. We're kind of like right. the, the icing on the cupcake of Orwell. And it's it's a really good brand muffin actually of Orwell I think very sweet very juicy very tasty but nonetheless a brand muffin we however are the really watch what comes out of it you better be careful (laughs) (laughs) we're like really really good cream cheese frosting or buttercream frosting no cream cheese we've got cream cheese some yeah we've got something to us but this was the these were the statistics that I found that I thought were the Fleisch Kincaid scale, there are several different kinds of scales. There's the fog index, there's a Fleisch Kincaid, there's a Lexile score. All of these things are scored um, using using math. And one of the ways that they do their math is they look at the length of sentences, the length of words, syllable count. Um, they look at the numbers of sentences in paragraphs or in the reading selection. Um, they they have all these different things and then they have an algorithm and they come out with a number. And some of the scales have numbers that mean nothing in real life and and you have to like translate what it means from their little charts, which is how Lexile scores work and the Fog Index to a certain extent. But the Fleisch Kincaid thing is uh, something you have access to, everybody has access to if they have Microsoft Word. And okay. how it works is when you do the spell check. Oh, yeah, that's you, where I've seen it. That's right. One of the options, if you look in the actual menu, is do you want to do a, a grammar check? And if you want to do a grammar check, do you want the Fleisch Kincaid number? And, uh, and their information gets spit out as a grade level. So you'll see on the slide, it'll say plus or minus sixth grade, plus or minus eighth grade. That's because they were within a couple of points of that particular grade so like Hillary Clinton right. was 7.7 so seventh year seventh month so seventh month of seventh grade uh, whereas Jeb Bush was 8.0 so he's eighth grade just dead on um, but this is really I thought very interesting because Trump was speaking um, and these were parsed over the course of uh, long multi-minute responses um, and I'm going to put a link to the video that the guy uh, took this data from uh, in the in the notes that are underneath the um, the video, so people can go and watch it themselves. And I actually have it start. I have that video start time accurate. So if you click on the link, it'll take you to this part of his video. But Trump was coming in at a fourth grade level, which sounds kind of insulting at first until you think about this for a moment. Uh, ben Carson, who is a neurosurgeon, came in at a sixth grade level. Bernie Sanders. Uh, Bernie Sanders is the one who comes out at the top, uh, 10th grade, which is also surprising because you've got the lowest score with the the winner. And then the guy who got everybody, the only other person to get people fired up was talking at a 10th grade level. 
And right. the New York Times comes in at eighth, eighth grade. And Chris Christie was talking above Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, really. But it's kind of important, I think, to notice it's not all Democrats at the top where you would expect to find kind of the ivory tower, um, kind of obnoxiously overread group of people just going off of, you know, stereotypes that people make about things like that. You know, Mm -hmm. the Democrats, all they care about is facts, blah, blah, blah. Chris Christie is up there at the top. He's chasing Bernie Sanders by not much. And um, and Hillary is not at the top, which is what I was expecting. And that's you kind of you got to think when you are speaking to the American public at large, Mm -hmm. you are talking a huge, wide range, wide, wide range of people Mm -hmm. because you can vote when you're 18. Yeah. Okay. So you want to you can be the biggest, widest. You want the the broadest span. Talking down is not that bad. No, and and it's really not, and it's actually helpful. Yeah, I think the trick is for more than not. Yeah, yeah, but it can't sound like you're talking down. No, no, you can't come in and you could go. So, what would you like me to do with the taxes today? Or, or the, um, I can tell them to Pokemon go to the polls. It's like, oh, woman. Oh, yeah, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. Because when she, actually, when she talks like a normal person, when she, when she talks like a muggle, she's actually really funny. But I don't know if her handlers told her not to do that. You know, God, don't be real, because that'd be a mistake. I have no idea what happened, but I saw her speaking another time, and I went, where was this woman during the campaign? Great. She, Sure as heck wasn't on TV. Whereas Bernie is just Bernie. Right. You know? And he's, but even he, I watched him on a, he was doing a town hall on health care, and they were holding it in Ohio, in a town that has been decimated by the opiate problem. I mean, there was oh. something, there was something like a hundred times as many pills as there were people in town on that given day which is okay that includes children i mean it's just it was a ridiculous amount of drugs that had been dumped on this town the whole economy had been trashed and and you could hear chris hayes he kept trying to get bernie to talk like a normal person and to stop doing like his his stump speech and he couldn't do it yeah you got it you got to you got to be able to talk like you're talking to a person, an actual human person. And that was, I think, one of the other things that, that Orwell touches on, I think importantly, and he, do, he doesn't linger on it, but it pops up, is the dishonest speech happens in politics all the time. That, yeah. that is not going to change. It is also not necessarily a bad thing as long as you recognize it. The problem comes with, it, there are two different problems, I think, that, that can go along with this. One is you don't recognize it and so you get boondoggled. Right. The other one is you hear that it's there and your reaction, therefore, is they're all a bunch of liars and why should I listen to any of them? They're all horrible. I'm not going to vote. It's like, no, you have to listen. That doesn't help. No. Yeah, that doesn't help. It doesn't help because somebody's going to govern you. So Right people can say well it's the lesser of two evils sure you can look at it that way but and and that may be a true statement it, it may be it very well may be the i think the but really you still got to make parts. a choice you got to make a choice and you got to base it on something so if you know everybody's lying to some level to some degree they're all using language to try and manipulate you to vote for them i think that's, that's their job statement. that's their job our job is, number one, don't use their language. If you, if you go to a town hall, force them to speak your language. Make right. them talk to the muggles. And number two, when you hear something that sounds wonky, poke at it and see what's, what's making it tick because there's probably something going on. And the only thing I could think of quickly was um, 
and this was this all happened when we were living in in New York on the Hudson River, and so we'd seen the Hudson River cleanup happen, mm-hmm. where the GE plant upstream had toxified the thing, so that when I was a kid. It was like, oh my God, don't go swimming in the Hudson and don't go fishing because the fish are going to come out with like three eyes and fangs. And right. All that stuff. People were fishing and swimming when I started the podcast in 2006. Absolutely safe. The water was absolutely, because GE cleaned up because they had to, they were held to it. So during that right. time, uh, the Clean Water Act comes out and it stopped all of us. And we went, why is there a new act? Because the old one from like 1972 worked really well. So, huh. So we started, you know, poking around because this was our water that was going to be affected. And it's called the Clean Water Act. But 60% of the protections that were in place, the 60% that just cleaned the Hudson, were being removed. Yeah, war is peace. War is peace. And freedom is ignorance. It's the Ministry of Truth. It was exactly the Ministry of Truth. And I know that there are other examples. That was just the only one that I, like, you know, was kind of there for. So it was the only one I could think of quickly. But I think the, um, I also put a bit.ly link if anybody wanted to actually check my statistics and facts. Um, it's there. Which is another thing. If people aren't going to cite, cite facts right, or statistics, then chances are they're blowing smoke or something up your shorts. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's real easy. It's real easy to get complacent. Yeah. And listen to the politicians. The last election is a really good example of yeah. because there were a lot of things I listened to and mm-hmm. I would turn around and I would spout them. You know, sure. I'd be like, turn around and I would spout them. And one of the things that saved me, I guess, in a, in a lot of ways was one of my sons, my oldest son. Mm-hmm. I would I would talk to him and I would say, well, because he would say, well, who are you voting for? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, we'd start talking. And I'd spout off some things and he'd go, well, yeah, but why is this? What is this? Oh, wow. And he would start poking at, at the speak that I had heard. And I'd be yep. like, I don't know. Let me hmm. check that. Oh, wait, I'm not sure. Why haven't I thought about that? Isn't that interesting? I mean, yeah. And it's, it's because it is easy to yeah. get complacent and not double check and not find the sources and find and dig down. You, you'll look at one article, mm-hmm. even two. But if they're written from the same perspective, what are you gaining? Yeah. Or, and this is another thing to check, if it feels like it's a copy of the first article you read, it is. And those are the ones that are coming out from websites where people just copy and paste. And they they are masters of search engine optimization so that they get hits on their site, but they're really just copying somebody else's article. And it could be from Reuters or it could be from Breitbart. It doesn't matter. People are doing it on both sides. Right. But if you feel There's, like you're reading the same thing, you are. Yes. Well, and I, I, I sent you a, a text about a Wikipedia article that a date had been changed. And the guy knowingly changed the date. And that was prior to them vetting the changes in Wikipedia. It was when it first started. And then he went back because he was trying to fix it because he knew what he had done. Right. He couldn't because it had been cited. The wrong date had been cited in so many places in so many different sources now that even though he knew it was wrong, he could not find a way to verify the correct date. It was only a year's difference, so it wasn't huge in the grand scheme of things. Right, but that's so But creepy. it did make a difference. It's the, if you repeat a lie enough. Yes. Wasn't that Stalin? I, if you repeat a lie enough, it becomes the truth? Oh, I think it's Big Brother, too. <laughs> <laughs> which which means it could have been too. either who did it first. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And and there was some um, there was a thing that went around on the internet. It was, was probably ten years ago, pre Facebook. But it right. was like it's raining cats and dogs, and there's the reason something is called a threshold. All of these things. Mm-hmm. Well, it irritated me so much because it was all based on lies. <laughs> it was all based on lies. It's raining cats and dogs because your roof should used to be made out of thresh, and the dogs and cats would sleep above, and when it rained, they would fall through. That's not true. That's not true. It's, it's not true. Oh but if God. you go, I, I know. It, well, and I went through and there was like 20 items. Okay. That's just one. Of them. There was like 20 different items, 20 different phrases that they were pulling this from, you know, right. a honeymoon for this reason, and all this stuff. Oh, None of them were correct. And so I went <laughs> through piece by piece and refuted every single one <laughs> for myself. <laughs> and I've seen it cited in more places as fact now. Oh, God. Because it's been over 10 years yeah. and that one page 
has been repeated by other people who believed it in so many and, and it's like you can't fight it now now it's become a reality it's become the real and it's not wow yeah wow. well and that goes along i think that goes along with the if it sounds too good to be true it probably isn't if it sounds too horrible to be true it, isn't. it, it probably, probably isn't yeah wow repetition wow. equals truth yes and that that's th sad that's that is Orwell's thing. If you keep repeating this weak-minded language, then you are actively degrading our ability to think. And that's a yes. terrifying responsibility to... Re I mean, if high school teachers... Well, no. If middle school teachers started kids in seventh grade English by saying that to them and getting them riled up about injustice and all the things that seventh graders do get riled up about. Oh gosh, everything. Ever have a hard time teaching them English again. Yeah. But you're going out on a limb to say that to a bunch of seven-year-olds so, or seventh graders. But I had a friend who used yeah. to say uh, humorously when we would go out to, to bars and places that, um, that he was going to go to the euphemism room. <laughs> <laughs> because that was so much nicer than saying bathroom. And at it's first, I looked at perfect. him and went, blink, blink, blink. But Orwell talks about euphemisms. But he's talking about the military ones in particular. Yes. And, and I put the, the, two, the first two are his that I put up on the slide. The third is one he did not live to see. Uh, pacification, which I remember yes. as a kid, the pacification of the Vietnamese. Uh, I remember the transfer of population, also in Vietnam. And then the one with Gulf War one. um Desert Storm was collateral damage. That was the first time I heard that. Right. And that's, you know, it's, I know there's more. Oh, there's it's, a lot more. I mean, there, yeah. It's your, it's your kid putting their life on the line for a euphemism, a political oh, euphemism. It, Did it drive you any time? Anytime I heard the words collateral damage and any of my sons were overseas, I was immediately on guard. I was like, Oh, that's a bad, bad thing. Yeah, that's a really that's that means somebody died. That yeah. means many people died. Many that people means died. many people and many many people died and many buildings were destroyed. That's yeah. usually what that means. Lots yeah. of money was lost yep. because of life and property. Yep. So anytime I heard collateral damage, uh, my my antennas went up. Yeah, I bet. You know, I mean, any oh gosh, there was a lot of things that would, you know, I'd be la 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 whoop. What was that? Mm. You know, you because you learn. Yeah, you learn to pay attention. You learn. Yeah. Oh, police action in this area. What did it what? ever? Did it ever? As a military mom, as a mom of kids in the military, did it ever get discussed? I've always wondered this on the inside because there's very much a line around. Um, uh, my kids are overseas fighting, and my kids aren't. There's you know there is there is a a, a line of. Um, a psychology of participation or a psychology of, of risk that the, the amount of skin that the two different sides have in the game are very, very different. And one is philosophical and one is my kid. Well, let me, let me, let me answer that in part by saying people are idiots. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Because, well, yeah. Yeah. Because I worked at a magazine at the time mm -hmm. okay and i had lots of different philosophies around me all the time from lots of lots of different areas of life i mean that's just you have to have that diversity mm -hmm. and i had a woman come up to me uh, one of the editors came up to me one time and it was after guantanamo bay came out you know and all right. that stuff that was going on there right and i wasn't i really my other sons protected me. Whenever one son was gone, the other ones were like, "No, mom, you can't watch this movie, or you can't watch you can't watch this news." Or they were very protective. Good kids. Yeah, they were good. They were good kids. But I've never seen you know some movies because of that. <laughs> but but whatever. But anyway, so I didn't really know what Guant Guantanamo Bay was. Okay, right. because I had been protected from it internally right. in my home. And this one woman came up to me and she said, "Oh." is your son one of the ones in Guantanamo Bay? And I had three other friends who were around who grabbed her and removed her. They, they completely just removed her from, from me. And I didn't really, I, it went over my head. I had no right. idea what she was talking about. I, I was like, 
no, you know, and, and, and yeah, then no everybody's leading her away. And I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> well, then I went, <laughs> then I went home and I figured out what was going on. And I'm like, oh she had the nerve to ask me that she had the nerve to cross that line. She had the nerve to same woman, six or eight months later. Oh, no. Um, yeah, one of my sons was something had happened and he was in some action and you know, thankfully he was fine. All of my sons are fine. They all came home safely. I feel very very blessed. But something had happened and I got a phone call. And so I'm I'm listening to this phone call and I hang up and I and I turn around and she's standing there and I'm like and and she said what happened and I told her and she starts screaming and crying like it was her kid or something. And I'm looking at her like, you've got to be kidding me. You're really going to do this in front of me and try to create a hysteria. Or you're going to create a hysteria in me. Again, I had two really good friends, came around oh the corners. God. Let the crazy <laughs> woman go up. that way. <laughs> kind of removed her, That's you know, and it's like, what is wrong with you? I, and that one, I, I was aware of what was going on. And I was kind of looking at her. I'm like, seriously? What is wrong with you? Why would you cross that line? You don't do that. That's not what you do. No. You know, so yes, people are idiots. Um, yeah. yeah. People will cross that line. They will ask you questions that they really have no business asking. Right. And, and that is nothing but fear. It's yeah. nothing but fear for you. Right. Because for me, the, the old adage, no news is good news very much true right especially in the military call and you don't want the car showing up at your front door right you don't you don't want any of that if you're hearing nothing that means everybody's fine how did it how did it how did it uh how did people react on the inside when and i'm i'm trying to remember who was speaking the first time i heard the term collateral damage during desert storm i can't remember it wasn't colin powell I don't. I don't, I don't even think it know who either. I don't think it was at a one of his briefings. He was very good. No, he 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 didn't start using that that euphemistic speech until he had been exposed to the publicity and the, mm. the for Some a good year. Him. Yeah, he had to be trained into that because he was he did not do that well in the beginning. And which and I, I say that's, and that's sad that I say he did not do that well. Yeah. He did, he did really well by my standards because I, I knew right. he was speaking from a place of truth. Yeah. And but you can't truth. have that. You can't have that truth coming out. So as a so as a as a as a mom hearing military leadership or political leadership coming out and saying there was an action and there was uh, there were uh, there was collateral damage. Did it ever piss you off that they were saying that, or that oh, they yeah. were saying it that way? Oh yeah, that would that would infuriate me. It would. It okay. Yeah, this is a good this is a good way to relate it to, because it's hard to relate that the family aspect when mm -hmm. it's your family that's over there. Okay. Right. But think about when somebody comes back from a war or a police action or right. whatever you want to call it, a pacification, whatever you want to call it, you don't ask them, did you kill anybody? Hmm. You don't ever say those words. Yeah. But, but, but why? Okay. Why, why would you not say that? Mm. Because that's rude, <laughs> number yeah. one. That, that because, be really yeah, if you really think they were over there that whole time and didn't kill anybody, yeah. then where then are you idiot. living? Yeah. Yeah. You're an idiot. You're a complete idiot. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 it's the same thing when they use the words collateral damage and things like that. It's, it's a rude way. It's really rude because what they're doing is, yeah. It, well, and they're denying what actually happened, but right. they have to. That's got to be such a schizophrenic way to live during it campaigns where your children are overseas because on the one hand it's got to be I know they're saying this so that I'm not hysterical every minute of every day and I know they're saying it knowing I know what they really mean right and my kids signed up and I know what they're doing and it's not like it's a shock 
Well, you know, there's one oh, of there's the things. So my things. There's so many aspects because I I wrote to all my sons. That was one of the things we did is we wrote, you know, letters, not emails, because yeah, they no. didn't always have access. So we always hand wrote. And we we did emails too, but there was a lot of writing involved. Yeah. And I'm not a great pen pal, but I was real good one <laughs> with your kids, <laughs> with my kids, yeah. And one of my sons came back and he and he would ask me so many questions because he was curious about it from my side. He and that was one of the things he wanted to do is he, he was he kept saying and and he still says it sometimes. He wanted to write a book about what it was like from the other side of the military, from the other mm. side of service instead of from his side. Whoa. From the home side because you have to do your everyday things. You have to go to work. You right. have to pick up the groceries. You have to clean up after the dog. Right. You have to clean the bathroom. You have to do all these normal everyday things knowing that people are actively out there trying to kill somebody that you love. Right. Every single day. Right. Every minute of every day. Right. That every day he's still breathing, you're thankful. Right. And yet you have to just go along and do your thing. Hmm. So, yeah, and, it's really... And you're, and you're not even... Uh, I mean, just going off of what you said about the, the woman at your workplace. Um, because, because there's such a disparity in the number of people who are um, actively involved in the military and people who aren't, but who talk a good game. It's like watching a football game. It's like acting like you're the guy on the field when you're talking about your team. It's like, oh, we really give it to him this time. No, yeah. sweetheart, you sat there and drank 15 beers. So just, Right. You were on the couch. I know. I yeah, was there. I was there. <laughs> I watched you eat the nachos, sweetie. Um, there's got to be such a, um, a weird disconnect on that level, too, about the going about your business and, and doing, doing your day the way that you always do your day. Because, you know, repetition and routine, I imagine can go a long way towards saving you in some of those instances. Mm -hmm. But but it makes a whole lot more sense now to me why uh, living on or near base or shopping at the, the PX would make a lot more sense just, yes. just to have people around you who are also going through their days, but in the same headspace that you are in. So yes. that the, the language that you're using with each other carries a very different weight than the language that you'd be using out at Macy's. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, because it, it is. It's a and, and to get through it is it's not it's not it's not easy. It's not um, to get through. Not not just to get through. You can get through it. Obviously, you can get through it. Nobody's right. shooting at you. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, you're fine. You're yeah. safe. But to get through it with your head intact, right? That's the hard part. It's so interesting because the, I mean, what when when Desert Storm happened, I was just barely out of college at the time, and I, I remember, not entirely unlike the woman at your work, feeling morally outraged. It was my overdeveloped sense of injustice. Morally outraged at the term collateral damage, because. Because, damn it, people were losing their lives and show yeah. them some respect. You know, there was really this, this anger inside me. And, and part of that became, why aren't, why aren't military families, why aren't people in the military actively outraged too? And now it makes perfect sense that you, you no, have you to can't get through be. the day and you need the, you need the euphemism mm -hmm. as much as you understand the euphemism. But but you've got is. to remember, too, that our society as a whole mm -hmm. has also gotten to experience that. Mm. Everyone. Everyone got to experience it when 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. Everyone who was not directly involved, mm -hmm. it hit them like, it, and it, it was, it was the same feeling for me. Even I was a little close to it. You were very close to it, obviously. Mm -hmm. You were in the trenches, okay? Right. But people on the outside, the country as a whole... That's what happened to them. They are suddenly cared mm. about someone far away who was in direct and immediate danger. Mm. And they had to go on with their day. Hmm. Everybody had to. Yeah. So that's why people want to say conspiracy theory or it didn't really happen or this or that. They want to say those things because it takes away the reality. And it takes away some of that pain because you yes. can put the pain someplace else. Yeah. 
And you can put the outrage someplace else. Right. And you can keep the outrage going. Because if yes. nobody has exposed the theory for the truth that it is, then you get to be outraged at that group now. So you can just transfer that. Oh, that makes so much more sense. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're channeling Orwell. I'm telling you, I think I, I really like him. I really, I really like him too. I really, and, I, and I've liked him since I was a little kid. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got know. hit with both Animal Farm in 1984 and eight, in 7th grade. No, 8th grade. And that, that was, um, oh, no, Lord of the Flies, Animal Farm, 1984. It's another one I love. I, I love Lord of the Flies. And it's horrible. I know. It's My 16-year-old just read it. And I just kept looking at Andrew going, all right, let me know when he gets to the chapter about Piggy. Yeah. And he said, oh, you'll be no, able that's... to tell. And it's like, yes, I could. He yeah. just finished the book two days ago. It's excellent. Excellent. But in a horrific, but so real. Yeah. And that's, and... I think, what I identify with in 1984 is the reality of it, the truth of it. Right. And it's still, right. it's still happening. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Well, in the, and the, you know, if you look at, it, I know that there are people who look at 1984 and say, oh, it's, um, no, back up. If you are the kind of person who says, Heather says, looking at herself, um, oh my gosh, sales of 1984 have gone through the roof right now because it's right now. And that means something. Um, it would be very easy to say that's being hysterical or um, you're, you're exaggerating things or uh, it's like, it's like how when you're in college, everybody calls anybody who says no to them a fascist. Right. Right. You know, it's just like it, when the language stops meaning anything, then it stops being useful. So just shut up. Um, but the 1984 stuff I think is, it's so much more multi-layered. And again, it goes back to the language because the, the, um, the stuff that Orwell does with um, the end of the, especially the end of this essay and with the warnings that come along with the book 1984 are how does something like this happen? It happens when everybody's complicit. It, it yes. happens when you normalize stuff that shouldn't be normalized. When you... Um, when you allow squishy language to be the language that not only you accept, but the language that you use, um, you're, you're feeding into the, the beast. And, and so the, the second to the last slide that I made was just as a, a uh, not a reminder, but a, a review that Orwell is not talking about sounding like Shakespeare. He is not talking about preserving an older or quote unquote better way of speaking or writing the way that like a school marm would. He's not even talking about proper syntax or grammar. He's talking specifically about clarity and precision. Because if you can't be clear and precise in the way you speak or the way you write, then your thoughts aren't clear or precise. And that's where I think the fourth grade thing versus the 10th grade thing becomes really important. Because if the New York Times are at an eighth grade level, and the New York Times are hard for some people to read, they are. They are. They are. And but they're mostly hard because I did an experiment with my students. Uh, they're mostly hard because you are expected to know stuff. The right. words themselves are not that hard. You just are expected to know background. You say they're not that hard, but you would be surprised. You would be surprised at how what people consider hard. Yes. Well, clearly. That's that's one of the things. It's it, and I'm not I'm not degrading anybody again, but. A construction worker speaks one way, mm -hmm. a scholar speaks another way, Yes, and, and someone who is schooled mm -hmm. speaks another way. Yeah. Okay? And the construction worker might think the one who is schooled is talking down to them, being patronizing mm -hmm. by using words that are, and I'm not talking big words. I'm not talking scholar level. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking that level. Complex sentences. Right. It, you'd be amazed. There yep. are a lot more, a lot more of us are construction workers than we realize. Yes. A lot more yes. are. Well, and I think that that's why the, the thing that I love the most about George Orwell is when he says, like we, we showed at the beginning, you're going to find more intelligence, more smart people at a pub in a coal mining town than you mm -hmm. are around a table at Oxford. 
exactly. the dining hall. Because it's That's a, one of his quotes that has stuck with me my entire life. Yeah. Because it's really important to remember that the, and I have this conversation all the time with people who are like, oh, I know I should listen to Craplet, but I don't, I didn't go to college or I only got an associate's degree or I never took an English class. I'm like, I know, that's why I do the podcast. Cause I didn't go to college. I, it sure didn't stop you from writing some of the best comments I've ever read on the post. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't have to stop you from learning either. Yeah. That's just it. No, and you, I mean, you look at all the, my grandfather who built the car when he was 11, never did anything past his high school graduation as far as education goes. And he didn't read much. I mean, yep. he read Zane Grey books. Yeah. Well, but I had to, my, my grandfather driver. could, he, he did not go past the seventh grade, mm. but he sat, he was blind when he was older. He was a engineer when he was younger and a farmer and all these things. Um, but when he was older, he, he was blind and crippled and he mm. sat in the driveway and and talked mm -hmm. my cousin into building the garage. Talked him through it. <laughs> that is so what my grandfather would have done if he yeah, could have done it. He could it. visually see it all in his head. Right. The angles, tell him the precise angles. You have to cut this at a 47 degree angle. You have to, it was amazing what right. was in that brain. Right. With a seventh grade education. I, well, you don't, you don't need more than that if you're going to keep thinking. Right. And I think that's one of the things that I, I thought was so marvelous about this, this whole essay is that the upshot of it at the end is pay attention. Don't. Yes. Don't. And, and don't. If you don't go into it thinking that it's going to be work or that it's going to be unpleasant work, I guess it's really the thing. Um, it won't be. Because, don't take the pablum that you're being fed. Yeah. Who likes go to ahead be lied and, to? Right. I don't like to be lied to. And I especially, I mean, I know for me, I, I like being able to listen to the people who think they're all that and a slice of bread and get jokes that they're not getting. Yes. <laughs> because they either haven't paid attention to real life very much or they haven't read one of the books we did on Craftlet. And That's we get all the jokes. Because life's so much more fun when you get all of those layers and there's nothing about a college education that gets that guarantees that you're going to get that in a college. Orwell didn't. Well, and what about the people who laugh at the jokes that aren't really there? <laughs> <laughs> because they're not brave enough to say, I don't get that. Mm -hmm. That's because it wasn't actually a joke. It wasn't actually a joke. <laughs> not so much. No, it's the emperor's new clothes kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. It's like, oh, look, that was very funny. Ha, 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 ha. What did she say? Yeah. <laughs> that was my, my last slide, too, was the um, just recognizing that dishonest speech happens, but that just because everybody does it doesn't mean that they're all doing it equally. And yeah. some, some dishonest speech is, in fact, way more worser than other dishonest speech. And that trolls on websites are particularly good at playing us on those on those fronts. Oh, they're very good wordsmiths. Yeah. Trolls are excellent wordsmiths. Yeah. Cuz you can't tell where they're from and you can't nope. tell what gender they are. And they're they can push good. those buttons. Oh yeah. They they are very they're psychologist majors. They really yeah. are. They are. They're psychology they majors and and they're wordsmiths. Yeah. Yeah. I've been reading uh, some stuff online by this guy, George Lakoff, who talks about framing and, and language. And the, the, aside from collateral damage, the one that I really remember was when estate tax suddenly became death tax. So who's going to yes. pay for a death tax? That's a horrifying. Why would you do that? Right. And it's right. like, well, no, this is like the top 1% of the top 1%. You can leave whatever you want to your family. Ain't touching us. But, but yeah, that was... Um, that was the first time that I really noticed it. And he's, he's the one who talks about a lot of that stuff. He's very, uh, he's very tuned into a lot of the stuff that Orwell talked about. The other thing that I love about Orwell is that he's actually actively funny in this essay. He makes fun. There are those five passages that he makes fun of. And I, I would actually encourage people if they were going to read this themselves, which I hope they do. Um, when you get to the five examples, which come early on, just skip them. Because <laughs> they're so badly written. It's like, yeah, just just skip over yeah. him. He's going to talk about him later and you can it's get fine. Yeah, you'll, you'll still get it. Yeah. You'll still get it. Then you can go it's, back and look at it and go, oh, that's what he's talking about. Ha ha ha. They're so stupid. 
it's one of the reasons I like Mark Twain essays. Mm. Same, same. He's got the same paradoxical humor. Right. He really does. Yeah, he does. He does. And he has, and he has a good old time playing with that stuff too. Which I yeah, have. I'm wearing um, my favorite Mark. I have a t-shirt on today. It's my favorite Mark Twain quote. Because I went to the Mark Twain house a couple of months ago. <gasps> oh. Fabulous, by the way. Oh. Um, but it's, it's imagine you're an idiot. And imagine you're a member of Congress. But I repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite. Favorite. Wow, some things don't change. Nope. Nope. Yep. Appropriate even today. Yeah, sadly. <laughs> but I, I keep thinking they just don't, they don't know how to talk to people who don't want the Orwellian language. We don't want right. to get fired up. And in fact, um, I, gave, I gave you that speech this morning. Yeah. As, a, as an introduction, this is a, a, a speech that was written in 1994 as a stump speech. And so for people who are listening, uh, see if you can hear any Orwellian rules that are being broken in the speech. All right. Have fun. Okay. Okay. This is Every Speech by Robert Yoakum. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to see so many friends from the 3rd con Congressional District. And what better sight for some straight talk than at this greatest of all state fairs, where ribbons reward American individual enterprise, whether for the biggest beats or the best bull? Speaking of bull, my opponent has said some mighty dishonest things about me. But what can you expect from a typical politician? I want to address some fundamental issues that set me apart from my opponent and his failed party, the party of gutlessness and gridlock. The American people are ready for straight talk, although they don't count on the press to report it straight. The, the press, like my opponent, has no respect for the public. This democracy must return to its roots or it will perish, and its roots are you, the honest, hard-working, God-fearing people who made this the greatest nation on earth. Yes, we have problems, but what problems would not be solved if the press and politicians had faith in the people? Take crime, for example. Rampant, brutal crime. My rival in this race believes that redemption and rehabilitation are the answer to lawlessness that is tearing our society apart. Well, if R&R &R is what you want for those robbers and rapists, don't vote for me. If pampering the pump punks is what you want, vote for my opponent. Do I believe in the be death penalty? You bet. Do I believe in three strikes and you're out? No, I believe in two strikes and you're out. I believe in three strikes and you're dead. You can count on me to crack down on crime, but I won't ignore the other big C word, character. Character made our nation great. Character and respect for family values. A belief in children and parents, in brothers and sisters and grandparents. Oh, sure, that sounds corny. Those cynical inside the Beltway journalists will ridicule me tomorrow, but I would rather be guilty of a corny defense of family values than of coddling criminals. While I'm making myself unpopular with the press and a lot of politicians, I might as well alienate even more Washington wimps by telling you frankly how I feel about taxes. I'm against them. Not just in an election year, like my adversary, but every year. I'm in favor of slashing wasteful welfare, which is where you got a lot of your hard-earned tax dollars go. The American people have said enough to welfare, but inside the Beltway, they don't give a hoot about those the industrious folks that I see before me today. They're too busy with their cocktail parties and diplomatic functions and society balls. My opponent loves those affairs, but I'd rather be with my good friends here than with those forked-tongued lawyers, cookie-pushing State Department fops, and high-priced lobbyists. I promise that when elected, my main office will be right here in the 3rd District. My branch office will be in D.C. And I promise you this. 
I shall serve only two terms and then return to live with the folks I love. So on November 8th, if you want someone with an independent mind and the courage to change, to change back to good old American values, if you've had enough and want someone tough, vote for me. Thank you and God bless America. <laughs> I love that when I sent that to you, your reaction was, that sounds like every political speech I've ever heard. Like, I know. It does. It does. Oh, man. It's yeah. entirely Orwell. And this guy wrote for Kennedy's 1960 campaign. He knew he knew exactly what he was doing. And yep. he did it beautifully. Yes, I thought so too. And he um the thing that I find really horrifying, appalling, brilliant, terrifying is that that was 1994. So that hasn't changed in 23 years. Yeah. The speech of speechifying wow. that our ears are used to hearing, that means we have been listening to nothing for 23 years. Which makes me wonder mm -hmm. how much of this is truth to us now, because oh, we've heard it repeated yeah. so much. Oh, all of it, right? I mean, if we like the person, you know, he's cute, or we knew his sister, or you know, my grandmother voted for Reagan because she had a crush on him when he was in the movies. <laughs> Not, nothing in his political platform moved her. She couldn't have cared less. And he's considered one of our best pre presidents. Yes, he is considered that. And I'm, you know, and and quite honestly, Nixon is considered one of our worst. And yet, he and Nixon did a lot of good. And opened Nixon China. did, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. It's um. <clears throat> I he think, who writes the history books rules the world. Yes, and I've been honestly, I have been more than a little surprised slash happy to hear regular. TV news commentators, um, uh, especially ones that you would expect to be uh, regular news commentators on the left, praising Nixon for the things that he did that were good and nailing Clinton for the things that he did that weren't and, and demonstrating some balance. You know, it's like, uh, like, like with, um, with, with our current president. There is a, a, a truism that's being floated that uh, people who didn't vote for him, for whatever reason, want him to fail. And I didn't vote for him. I don't want him to fail at things that are constitutional. Right. I don't want him to succeed at breaking the Constitution or doing anything illegal. But there are absolutely things that were in his platform, things that he put out there when he was on, on the campaign trail. When he'd start talking about um, uh, investing in infrastructure and the roads, because um, Dawn, who uh, um, crochet compulsive, her mm -hmm. husband was on the highway in Minneapolis when that bridge went down. Oh. I mean, our infrastructure is not okay. So, right. So, Yeah. Let's finally get somebody in who notices that there's a whole country and wants to invest in the infrastructure and hey, jobs. And okay, so it's going to be another WPA. I don't care. We need to fix this stuff. I would love to be able to support that. Right. So and, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn for anybody else I know who would turn around and say, well, we have to prevent him from doing something that's good for the country. It's like, no, 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 no. It's paying attention to the language. What's actually being done? What's actually being said? Because the dangerous thing is it's being done and said in our name. And if we travel overseas, like I'm going to shortly again, that can be kind of scary. Well, and there is no politician on the earth who has ever ruled, who has done everything that everybody wanted. Heck no. And that you, I don't care who you voted for ever in your lifetime or in anybody's lifetime in yeah. the history of all people that exist, okay? <laughs> Not everybody, except for the guy who votes for himself, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're not going to agree with every single thing they do. Absolutely. You're just not. It's no. not going to happen. And sometimes even the guy who voted for himself will change his mind. And that's fine, too. 
I would yeah. prefer that to having somebody do something bonehead and stupid and hurt people. Yeah. I don't mind. I, I never I never really got comfortable with that whole, um, the accusation of being flip-floppy or wishy-washy. It's like, but what if they change their mind for a really good reason? It's okay to change your mind. It's it. What's wrong is when you do it is when you know you're going to do it and you do it after you've been elected and then you flop on your party yeah. that it, that puts you in. That's wrong. Yeah. Or when you do it for expediency, like I'm going to say one thing to this group and another thing to this group and they won't talk to each other. So it's okay because it doesn't matter. Right. Right. That I, but that I you like. can have a, an opinion change. You can. I think you probably should. And then you can say, yeah, you, everybody should. That means you're listening to other ideas yeah that's what it means it means you're listening actively listening yeah and thinking right so i think that's true no and it will and not everybody who voted for trump was trying to put this you know this man down or negate women's rights or do this or do right that's not and and some of the things that are happening are appalling yeah are appalling but they've been happening for a long time they just weren't in the forefront too yeah that's true too and did you, do you ever watch the, um, uh, I think it's on CNN. It's, the guy is like 6'2 and black with an enormous fro. He looks like Questlove. He gets, fr- he gets mistaken for Questlove wherever he I, goes. I don't know this one. He, he has, has a-, a TV show called The United Shades of America. And oh, really? At first, if you just look at the logo, you're going to go, I really don't need to listen to angry men tell me about how much I suck. Right. And that is so not what he does. He's a comedian and he's he is the most smiley, friendly, disarmingly (laughs) adorable guy you've ever met. But we watched the episode last night where he went to Detroit because Detroit has uh, one sub two suburbs of Detroit have the highest Muslim population in the nation. So he, as a very large black man, goes into these suburbs of Detroit and the first person he sits down with is a woman who's a stand-up comedian and she's Muslim. And so she's really interesting. And then he meets an imam on the street who's got the kind of the, the low turban. It's, it's not a kufi. It's bigger than that, but it's, um, he's got the white turban on, he's got the robes on and he, he voted for Trump. And Kamal says, wow. Uh, Okay, why? And the guy said, well, because terrorism is a really big problem in this country and we really, we have to get a grip on it. And he's the only one who was talking about that. And you just go, wow. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, and Kamal does too. And it's, it's one episode after another like that where he's just so generous and open-hearted and, uh, and interested in hearing from people that people open up and talk to him like he grew up there and it's wonderful and the clip that I saw most recently which is up on YouTube is him talking to um, the white supremacist guy who was at the Heil Trump guy oh yeah that one's interesting because that guy really did not like Kamal I bet I mean yeah I would think and that would be very um... Uh uh-huh and yet the first episode is him going out and um, hanging out with a bunch of preppers in the mountains in um, West Virginia. Wow. It's, it's, it sounds like something I need to look at. It's United Shades of America. He's very, he's, he's just a sweetie. I like his stuff. And I'm putting links to all of the stuff we've talked about in, in the, the notes underneath the video, including a couple of um, videos of Christopher Hitchens um, who passed away several years ago, but he he had written a book called Why Orwell Matters, and there are a couple different uh, lectures that he did on on Orwell and stuff. And he's he's when I taught rhetoric at the University of Arizona, I always started by giving kids three Christopher Hitchens essays, knowing that I would convince them that um, they didn't have to come from a political viewpoint necessarily. Because uh, everybody was up in arms. It's like, oh, the pro- you know, the professors won't let us talk about whatever we want to talk about and kind of stuff. So the first essay was, I think it was called Not Even a Hedgehog. And it was about the stupidity of Ronald Reagan. The second one, I can't remember the name of it, but it was eviscerating Michael Moore. Oh, really? It just went after him completely. And the kids are all looking at me like, 
the f- the first one's Re- Reagan and the but Michael Moore. I'm like, I know. Just wait for the third one. <laughs> the, the third one is he attacks Harry Potter. Oh wow! So I'm like, look, if you can write really well, and you can defend your opinions, I don't care. This guy can write really well. He defends his opinions. He goes after everybody. He's not clearly one side or the other. He's just really, really smart. And, and equal opportunity. He is. <laughs> he, is. he is an equal opportunity uh, target maker. Right. That's crazy. <laughs> and it's, and it, but it's so true. It yeah. is. It's so true. Yeah. Well, and he, he always has smart things to say. And about half of them I agree with. And about half of them I want to throw him a shoe at the television. But that's okay, too. Makes me listen. As long as you're listening, yes, that's that's, and and that's part of the problem that we have with our internet the way it is. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's hard. hard. It's, it's really hard to listen actively. Listen, it's yeah. hard. It's easy to passively listen. Yes, and dismiss. Yes, and it's, it's really difficult too. to actively listen, though. Yep, yep. I totally, totally agree. Thank you so much for coming and doing this with me. Of course. Yay! I had fun. I had fun too. <laughs> All right. Well, have a good night. Say good. Say hi to Big Texan for me. I will. I will. You take care, sweetie. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.